Okay, well, I'm showing uh, 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started uh, so we don't, we don't run late. And if people continue uh, coming in, the first part um, is okay to probably miss a little bit. Um, hopefully, you know, my name is uh, Bill Rogge. I'm the director for the um, Harmful Algal Bloom Program for Seneca Lake Pure Waters Association. And I appreciate uh, all of you because the volunteers are the core of this whole program. Um, we've uh, really come a long way in the last few years, and uh, this year promises to be uh, even better. And all that's due to the volunteers stepping up and, and doing their part. Uh, for new volunteers, you should have uh, gone through the DEC um, video training uh, already. For those returning, uh, this is uh, the sum total of your required training, but I do encourage you if you've never actually seen a bloom in the wild, uh, you might consider going through and, and just reviewing that training again. Uh, it's, it's pretty well done and helpful, uh, particularly those that haven't seen them. So what we're gonna do today is um, talk about the Pure Waters program uh, in general, what we're doing, then go through some of the results from last year just to, so that everybody is aware of, of what happened and then the meat of it is going to be the 2021 process and procedures, what we're doing this year. Uh, a few changes, uh, not too many, but uh, it's real important that everybody know exactly what we're doing and where to go to find their information. So program objectives really haven't changed that much. Uh, we're out there to, to tell the community uh, when blooms are happening and provide them information they need to avoid problems. Uh, we also are collecting data, and that's for research uh, uh, in and of itself. Uh, FLI uh, helps us a lot with the research, and our Bloom database is great because we can compare it to other lakes and year to year. And then we also have a dock monitoring program that collects both atmospheric and water uh, parameters uh, that plug into the research data that Dr. Halfman uh, works on, again, in conjunction with other lakes. So, you know, the bottom line is that, uh, you know, we see our job as helping everyone in our watershed uh, keep themselves and their pets safe during the HAB season. Training wise, um, we want you to be able to detect and identify a HAB, uh, which again is presumed for experienced volunteers and DEC uh, presentation fills that uh, objective. For this part, uh, you probably already know your regional coordinator, hopefully, uh, and that's how you got here. Uh, so uh, that probably is already done, but we want you to know your zone number and endpoints and, and work with your RC, RC on that. Uh, if you have other zone team members, we want you to know who they are. And again, the RC will help connect, connect you if you're not already connected. And then basically uh, the core of this briefing is about uh, what our, our requirements are for surveying and reporting. And then uh, obviously how to fill out uh, the form correctly uh, without errors, uh, which causes me a lot of problems after it gets in. So some kind of additional uh, objectives is we wanna be able to find as many HABs as we can. We're not out there every day, but, but do it as well as we can, but doing it safely. Uh, we wanna keep others safe, we want to educate others, and we want to represent and promote Pure Waters uh, in a good manner. We want to try to recruit people to uh, be members, to contribute, and even to volunteer uh, if they're amenable to doing that. It's a brief overview of the organization. A couple of years ago, we split up uh, and had these uh, regions, and so that continues. That's proven to be a good, um, good model. Uh, we have kind of some port areas, communications where Bloom Watch is done, and then information management. There's a lot of data actually behind the app, uh, reporting app, and uh, for managing the, all you volunteers. And so I take care of that right now. We'd love to have more people uh, volunteer to help with this management function. And this gives you just a, a quick idea of where the uh, quadrants are. Uh, Northwest uh, for me, 
Uh, southwest is now Barb Miller uh, taking over for Peter Muller. Uh, the Northeast, Steve Bromka taking over for Rich Adams last year. That was great, does a great job. And Sarah Haslett uh, down in the Southeast. <clears throat> Other partners that, that we deal with kind of behind the scenes, I think as far as you're concerned, but you, you ought to know about, it's the Finger Lakes Institute and the uh, Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Lisa Kleckner, John Halfman do a lot for us. Uh, they do uh, testing. When we do testing, uh, there'll be uh, small amounts of it this year. And then the doc monitoring and analysis and, and that sort of thing. DEC has the overall program for New York State. Uh, they have a website and everything and do training, uh, as you saw before. And then we work closely, actually, with Canandaigua and Keuka Lake. Um, I, they've uh, basically, we host their, their versions of the same app that we use. And so that way we have this very common uh, database. So uh, results from last year. Uh, first, let's talk about what a bloom is and what high toxins mean. I think this can get confusing to a lot of people, but bloom uh, is based on, in New York State, is based on a blue-green chlorophyll, which is a specific a wavelength of chlorophyll that cyanobacteria uh, have, uh, particularly toxic ones, and that being greater than 25 micrograms per liter. Um, and that has some basis in that uh, four micrograms per liter of toxin would be about what you'd expect if a bloom was that 25 micrograms uh, of chlorophyll. Um, blooms are visible below that level. So uh, it's not like, oh, if I detect a bloom, it's gonna, uh, or I detect cyanobacteria and I see it there, that it's necessarily gonna be greater than 25 micrograms. If it's fairly thick, uh, it's definitely gonna be greater. But if there's just little strings or wisps, um, it, it might be less. You can see it probably down to about 10, 10 or 12 um, micrograms per liter. So as opposed to just a bloom, high toxins refers to the amount of microcystin toxin that's actually in the bloom. So you can only find that out by testing. And so since we're not doing sampling this year, we won't really be able to determine, oh, this is high toxin or this is not. But we've done testing in previous years and uh, I think it's well over 80% of the blooms that we have on Seneca Lake have tested high toxin. So one has to assume that if we see a bloom, it's fairly thick that it's got high toxins in it. I will note that the uh, New York State Department of Health recreational limit is four micrograms per liter, so much less than high toxins. And that the drinking water limits, uh, somewhere around one microgram per liter, uh, is even much less than that. So you may have toxins in water uh, of one microgram or two micrograms without actually seeing a bloom. Uh, and once in a while, uh, there have been detections like that. Okay, so uh, last year, DEC started uh, confirming blooms using photos on only. They stopped uh, supporting any sampling programs. Uh, so we're doing the same. Um, and part of that is because trained volunteers have proven to be very accurate. Uh, so all of you have done a very good job. Uh, we've, we've done this in the past. Uh, people identify the blooms. We see the pictures and it's clear that the blooms were there. So uh, we'll continue doing that. Um, so last year, uh, we didn't sample, but we only had 15 confirmed blooms, uh, much, much less than what we've experienced in previous years. From the table, you can see really 2017 was the first year we, we ramped up and had the current model in place. Uh, 17 and 18, we sampled. Uh, everything that we could see and get to. Um, and, and, but we've grown the system. So 2019 and 20, we've had quite a bit of the lake covered. Uh, 2019, you can see we had about 130 uh, confirmed PABs all over the place. Uh, we only sent uh, 40 for toxin testing and 34 of those came back uh, high toxin. 
So uh, you can see 22 out of 50 and 17, 36 out of 39 and 18, 34 out of 40 and 19. So, um, so why uh, did we only see 15 last year? And that was true. The doc monitoring program has a camera. 2019 saw many, many blooms uh, from the doc monitoring cameras. 2020, almost none. <laughs> Here you can see uh, how the blooms occurred over time by date. Um, so in August, uh, we saw a couple uh, and that's pretty typical. Uh, and then the last 31st of August, we saw seven blooms, uh, all actually in the Southern part of the lake. Uh, so that was by far the biggest day that we saw. Uh, and fairly typically around Labor Day is when we see a, a big spike like this. But, um, it's mystifying why through the month of September, which is normally, normally a very active month for HABs, uh, we only had two days where we saw any and, and then it was just like one or two. Uh, and then in early October, we saw a couple and then nothing. So that was a big, um, big surprise. And let's just compare that to 2019 where you can see about the same time frame we saw our first bloom, third week of August. And then Labor Day saw a big spike, you know, 20, 19 and 20, uh, back to back days. And then you can see kind of the pulsing pattern that is pretty typical uh, that we've seen over the last few years and, and actually in other lakes too. Um, not sure why it pulses like that, could be just the weather patterns, uh, but that, that's a fairly typical pattern. So a lot more activity in 19 than 20 as we've seen. This one is the same. It just shows you the different regions where we saw it. And uh, I think it shows that the blooms happen all over the lake. Uh, it's not, oh, it's in the Northeast or in the uh, Southeast or whatever. It's, it's typically uh, when the blooms happen, they're happening all over. Now let's compare 2020. Remember we had hardly any to Canandaigua, a lake that's actually supposed to be uh, pure, if you will, uh, than uh, Seneca Lake, uh, but they've been getting a lot of blooms lately. They've expanded the number of volunteers, so they're covering more of their lake than they had previously, but last year was a record year for them. You can see they started third week of July, fully a month before we saw our first blooms, and they would see multiple blooms uh, on many, many days. Uh, and then you can see the, the Labor Day spike sort of happening. So lots on the, on the 8th, uh, but then kind of that pulsing going on uh, into October. So um, no one can figure out, you know, why that is. Uh, we do know the lake water was warmer last year, record year for uh, warmth. Uh, it was drier than normal, the lake uh, level was going down. Uh, we did have indications, though, that it was windier uh, than normal during September, particularly. And so wind means more rough water, uh, but the direction may have had some issue with that, too. But what we noticed in talking with John Halfman is that, well, uh, other lakes, of course, experience the same conditions. Owasco, uh, uh, their lake level dropped uh, very, very uh, low. Uh, but they had record blooms. Canandaigua, you saw, had lots of blooms all, all through the season. And some of them were very, very uh, thick. Uh, Cayuga was active July through October. So the only thing we can figure is, is perhaps the specific directions and the topography uh, that we have on Seneca just was affected differently than, say, the same conditions on the other lakes. I wanted to make you aware of a couple of other things that we're doing um, that you're probably not involved in, but um, you might be interested in is uh, one is that we do the shoreline monitoring, but uh, we'd like to start finding out what happens in the middle of the lake. So there's a few of us that use uh, another ArcGIS app to track uh, when we go out on, on the lake. And so we can draw the the blue lines are, are routes, and so we draw a route on there. And then you can do, um, if you see a bloom, then you can go to a part of the, uh, the app that you document the bloom and capture the photo and, and it, it puts a dot then 
uh, where that is. It takes a little training to do the route, particularly on a phone, um, but people were getting the hang of it and we'll continue on a small scale uh, basis this year, but later on, if, it, if we think it's worthwhile, we may open that up. So people might wanna volunteer for this. Uh, the dock monitoring program, this will be the third year, uh, time-lapse cameras, weather stations, water temperature. Um, so last year, uh, this says no blooms. I was looking at the data, actually there were a couple in the Northeast uh, that were detected early on, uh, but everywhere else, uh, no blooms detected, which kind of reinforces, you know, what our um, volunteers were seeing is that there were no blooms. Uh, so we're compiling that data. There's a lot of data that comes from that. Uh, John Halfman has a really great uh, report though on it. It's on our, our regular uh, HAB site. Uh, so if you're really interested, it's really a good report because it compares the other lakes to us and goes into a lot of uh, interesting information. And uh, uh, John's co copied this sort of program for other lakes too. So we can compare results and, and get stuff out there. Uh, we are doing a bit of a study to answer the question, uh, is it safe to go in the water if you don't see a bloom sort of thing? So if you see a bloom like in the picture, is it safe to go in the water, say, uh, a few yards away from where it's visible? So we did um, a little bit of it last year, uh, but since we didn't have very many blooms, there wasn't much opportunity to really do it. So if we see more blooms this year, we'll be trying to take samples uh, in the bloom uh, and away from the bloom and uh, particularly after a bloom dissipates. We take another sample and see if there's residual um, toxins left uh, in the area. And we're also testing a new uh, field test kit for toxins. So this one uh, has been given fairly good reviews uh, in other places. It's only somewhere around 30 to $35. Um, it's advertised to be sensitive down to the drinking water limit. Uh, it only takes a total of about uh, 30 minutes or so to get results. Uh, it comes on, a, as you see on the picture, there's a little test cassette, sort of like a pregnancy test or whatever. Um, a lot of tests use this. And um, so we're testing to see if we like it and how easy it is to use and whether it's suitable to you know, advertise for the general public. Uh, we did a few tests and Canandaigua did, did a few of them for us too. And so far the, the tests were pretty good. Uh, when we did it where the bacteria were visible, they were all positive. Where it was clear, they were all negative. And then there was one where it was kind of muddy water and not really a bloom and that was negative too. So um, we only got 11 done last year. We're gonna order some more kits because the other ones expired. And we'll try this again this year and, and see what comes up. I wanna put in a pitch too. We, uh, Ontario and Yates County have funded um, informational signs about HABs. Uh, we've got uh, about a dozen uh, metal signs uh, suitable for uh, you know, parks or campgrounds or other places like that that are uh, very durable. Uh, we need help. Uh, getting people to, to put them up. And this is Yates and Ontario counties. Uh, we also have a lot of posters and those can be done anywhere. So if you have places where there's bulletin boards or other things where people, uh, a lot of people are gonna go in and out, this is a great uh, option for that. And we can, we can provide those to anyone. Uh, we're also looking into ways of providing PDFs to say those that rent out their places can put in information books or post on their refrigerators. All right, so now the, the meat of the uh, training, which is this year's um, processes and procedures. So our season, uh, official season will go from August 2nd, which is a Monday through uh, October 10th, which is uh, Sunday of Columbus Day weekend. Uh, We'll continue, we'll do a pre-season. So that means you can report, although you're not required to do surveys starting on July 12th. Uh, so we'll open the reporting then. And we'd like if people are able to continue uh, searching and reporting through the end of October. Um, our weekly cycle is the Monday through Sunday. 
and our ask, the contract is a, a minimum of one survey per week. Uh, that's a survey and report. Uh, we would like you to report every time you do a survey. So if you do three surveys a week, please report three times, uh, even if there's no bloom, because we do want to know uh, when there are not blooms. Uh, that's very valuable information in and of itself. Um, if you do see a bloom, uh, we can't uh, assess it unless you take photos. So please take photos of all the blooms you see and try to make sure that your camera is GPS enabled. Uh, your phone uh, has location data uh, sharing on so that the app reads the GPS information off the photo and that's how it tells where the bloom is. So it's very accurate. Um, so we do encourage you to, to start in the preseason, go through the postseason as much as you can. Uh, but again, one, one per week minimum, and our cycle is Monday through Sunday. Um, you'll be hearing from the RCs and, and me. Um, you know, we'll probably give you something at the beginning of the week on Monday to say, okay, we closed out, and now we're starting another cycle just to, to keep the cadence going. Uh, as the weekend arrives, be another reminder. Uh, if you haven't uh, gone out during the week, just a general reminder that, okay, you know, Sunday's to close out. And then um, we'll also be putting out bloom watches, maybe, and it depends on how fast I can do them, but maybe by Tuesday, but usually Wednesday or Thursday, it'll come out with, you know, what the results were from the previous week and some sort of articles or other information. Now there is a real-time scorecard that'll be on the um, web page. It's also on the uh, volunteer resource page on the bottom. And that, that data is actually uh, real time. It, it comes directly off of our data system. So that's a good way to see if uh, someone wants to know if there's been a bloom reported today, you can look on there and say, oh, yep, somebody's got one. So how to conduct surveys. Um, we found that if you can walk the shoreline, that's the best because that's where the, the HABs tend to be. It's right along the shore. Uh, that's where they accumulate. Uh, you can use kayaks, but, um, you know, and sometimes that's required because of the way the property is or uh, their steepness out there or whatever, but they're not as good for the smaller, really shoreline HABs, but they work great um, for ones that are a little bit larger uh, that are, uh, extend a little bit further from shore. So obviously take your camera and if you're in a kayak, do a life, life vest. Um, as far as zone coverage, just uh, do as much as you can. Uh, uh, if you know it's rough and you can't get out, that's fine. Then just say that you uh, looked at a small portion of your zone. Um, but if you don't have the time, you can only look at 50%, then 50% is fine. Um, it's not uh, critical to do the whole thing every single time uh, or all the time, but do as much as you can. Um, if there's multiple members uh, helping with zones, so we have a number of them, like in uh, Geneva, there's a number for each zone. Um, try to coordinate, um, you know, hey, I'll go Monday, Tuesday or whatever, or I'm going today, uh, we'll let you go or week to week or whatever. Uh, if you can't cover a zone in a week, so you're on vacation or you have something else going on, please let the regional coordinator know. Um, they might be able to find somebody to back it up or um, do something else to get some coverage there. So the, the better we know that, the better we can ensure that we're, we're covering everything that we need. And then while you're out there, uh, talk to people. Tell them what you're doing. Uh, tell them that we're, um, you know, Pure waters, and we're trying to help make you safe and and recruit them, educate them, and recruit them. Okay, last year we started doing uh, bloom descriptions uh, as part of the reporting. This is beyond what uh, DEC asked for, but we think it's uh, going to be valuable information uh, as we get more blooms. It might see some trends in there about um, sizes and and or appearance and structure and the and the colors and that sort of thing. So uh, we ask a few questions. There's nothing exact about it, but I just want to go through a couple of examples just to 
to help people be on the same page here. So appearance or structure, um, we know that they can take uh, a lot of different patterns or forms, the streaks, the spilled paint sort of look, dots, splotches are really thick. So those are the descriptors that we use. Um, but, you know, there may be different patterns in different parts of the bloom. Just try to do your best and just uh, report what you think the dominant pattern is. For intensity, uh, we know that some of them are really thick, if you will, or, or very opaque, while others you can see right through it and it's hard to see the dots in there. So we're going to use the descriptors uh, light and sparse for under about 25%, uh, medium 25 to 50, and dense above 50. And this is about uh, just in the bloom itself. So if the bloom's here and then, oh, I'm looking at a big space, so it's not overall a bigger space, it's not that dense. Now we're looking at where you can see the bloom internal. Color, uh, it can vary a lot. Bright green seems to be the dominant uh, color from what we see, uh, but it can be dark green or a blue green color. Uh, yellow, like some of you may have seen yellow patterns that looked exactly like blooms this spring, that's pollen. Uh, but later this summer, the pollen's gone and, and blooms can have a yellow color. Or when they age, they can be white or gray. Um, if it's mixed uh, quite a bit, then just choose other. And you can put uh, the colors that you're seeing in the comments if you'd like. So pretty easy. Uh, so I just got a couple pictures here. Uh, this one is from a boat, actually, a couple of years ago, but you can see the streaky appearance, so that's pretty obvious. Intensity, um, you know, I can see, I would probably say medium, but I can see someone saying dense. Uh, it's pretty thick there and getting close to that, uh, that amount. And then uh, clearly it's a, a bright green color. Uh, this one, I think this was out by my house, uh, a lot of dots. Uh, kind of light and sparse, transparent, see right through it. But again, bright green color. This one I think is in the marina down in Watkins. Um, so you can see the scummy appearance, really thick, uh, dense, uh, and a white gray color streaking through it. Uh, I could see choosing other since there's dark green and white gray and, and other colors too. So just use your judgment uh, when you see it and, and Give it a shot. Okay, you can see this one uh, kind of splotches, uh, maybe streaks, um, but uh, within the, the um, pad itself, it's, it seems pretty dense to me. Uh, and it's got that yellowish color. So um, here's one that's, that's a hab that's, that is kind of yellow. All right. So uh, the volunteer webpage, hopefully all of you have bookmarked it already uh, in getting here. Uh, everything you need, uh, I hope, is on that page. And if you need something that's not there, let us know and we'll get it there. Uh, so you have uh, the survey form link. Uh, there's training materials, um, practice survey. The zone map is there. Uh, the, the DEC video is there. We'll, try to get the link for uh, recording this section, session uh, and also the PowerPoint slides that you're viewing today are, are all on the, on the site. And then there's also a resource guide. So that's kind of a, a quick and handy uh, tips guide on, on all the procedures that we're doing here. And then at the bottom, there's a Bloom scorecard and the off for the offshore reporting, there's a link there too. So pretty much everything you need, and, and we'll go there in a little bit. Um, so we've already talked about this. Everyone uh, needs to complete this briefing in the DEC for the first ones. Uh, you can use a practice survey link that'll download a different app than a real one, but that you can get practice uh, using it, uh, doing that. And then as I stated before, we'll open the official uh, survey app on July 12th. And so after that date, if you do a survey, go ahead and report it. Um, 
So more about the app. Um, the mobile app is very stable uh, for reporting. Uh, so if you're using a phone, that really is the best way to go. If you're using a computer, I would use the browser version. And so you can, when you go to the, the reporting link on the volunteer page, you'll get to a question that says, do you want to use a browser or the app? So if you uh, the first time you're going to use it on the phone, you'll say, oh, I, I want to use the app. Um, and it'll download to your phone, and then you won't have to go to that link anymore. You can just open the app. For the computer, you'll go to the link every time and choose the browser. Um, there was a time when I had difficulty using the Chrome browser, but I've checked it out and Safari and Edge uh, both seem to be very stable if you're a Chrome user and you have problems. So just switch over with that. Um, the app may ask uh, for access to your location. Please enable that um, to help us out. And um, I just want to mention that DEC uses um, the browser version of the same ArcGIS, uh, but we're not using their system or you're not using their system. Uh, when there's blooms, then we will transfer the information, upload it to DEC system so that we'll show up on their maps. Um, they go through a couple delay, a couple day delay to check the photos and confirm them and that sort of thing. So it'll be up there. Um, it'll just take it a couple days. And then um, they have a public uh, reporting uh, link. Um, we don't do that. So only volunteers will be inputting into the Seneca Lake uh, reporting system. So um, using the app, uh, there's a link to a, um, a how-to guide uh, for uh, setting this up that's on the volunteer webpage. So you can go through that. And that's got a step-by-step -step with some of these pictures in it too. Uh, but this is kind of an overview. So to use it on the phone, if it's not already there, you go to the whatever app store that you go to and you look for ArcGIS Survey 123. So that's the overall uh, ArcGIS app. And then we're going to download a form into it. So once you uh, download it, it'll come in on your phone and that's what ICON uh, will look like. Once you, uh, so the first time after you download it, then you go to the link on the volunteer page and open that link. Um, and then you say, I wanna use the app uh, to input the information. The system will automatically download the form into the app on your phone. So, and this is what that'll look like. So when you open the app on the left, you want to hit continue without signing in. Don't, don't do a, a sign in. This is a public form. So once you hit continue without signing in, then you'll get to a page where it so, shows the different forms that you've downloaded. So you can see here, I've got three, um, the blue green uh, test kits that I talked about. We have a, a capturing uh, app for that, and then the offshore survey app that I talked about. This one will say Seneca Lake Hab Shoreline Survey, and that's the one you want, and you just touch it, and it will open up. Um, let me go back for a minute. Um, for those that are returning, this should already be there. It's the same app as last year, but it has been updated. So at the top, when you get to the screen, instead of my survey one, two, three, or maybe below it, it'll say updates available. And so just hit that and it'll download the newest version of the form. All right, so when you see a bloom and you're reporting, I recommend two photos with each bloom. The system will allow three uh, and that's fine. But what we really want is one that's close up so that we can see the pattern and go, yep, that's a bloom. And then another one with a broader perspective to kind of show the context and what, you know, the scale of the bloom. Um, photos are sometimes pretty large. So you may want to wait until you get to a Wi-Fi connection in order to complete uh, a bloom report. 
And uh, again, there is a practice form link if you want to download that and try to work with that. Okay, so the maps have given people problems before. Uh, so it's a great uh, tool, great application, but um, moving the map on a phone gets to be kind of hard. So we've automated that. So the map should be, uh, you shouldn't have to touch it. Um, if once you put in your zone number, it uses its own centroid as a location and it should show on the map. And if you scroll down to the bottom, it could, should show that location on the map. Um, if you capture uh, a bloom and upload the photo, then it, if the photo has latitude and longitude as shown here in these windows, this is part of the report form. If those show up in the windows, then it's reading the latitude and longitude off the phone. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, Steve Bromka always has problems with his phone, so I'm not sure what the deal is. Uh, but anyway, it'll at least have the information from the zone. Uh, no need to touch it further than there, but this just gives you an idea of whether it's reading the, the lat long or not. Uh, but then check the map and make sure that it's, that it's uh, correct. So when you go to the, the map on the website, um, each bloom report will come up with a, a, a bunch of information. So basically it says, uh, you know, who, who did it? Uh, and I'm not sure, I may have scrubbed off the name. Um, so at least though it'll have the zone date and time and then what information you captured uh, and the pictures will be available. So that's what comes out and this is all automated via the, the ArcGIS. Uh, so there is a zone map on the, um, on the website so you can see where your zone is or where other zones are. Um, please don't make changes to it. Um, and everyone should be set up with their zone numbers. And again, if you don't know it yet, then please um, work with your regional coordinator. You can go to the zone map on the legend. It'll have all the zones and the names on, uh, set with it. So you can look for your name see the zone and, uh, and then uh, know what the number is. And overall, uh, basically we've been the same over the last uh, couple of years. Um, about 60 of the 75 miles are covered. Uh, a lot of the non-covered stuff is kind of open land where people aren't living. Um, we've got over 80 active zones. And uh, so, we're, we're doing pretty good as far as uh, confidence that we're gonna find things if they're out there. Um, a reference guide is available on the volunteer page. Um, it's got basically kind of a quick and dirty summary of all the things that I talked about today. Um, and, um, you know, I just wanna encourage everybody to communicate uh, with the RC. If you got questions, don't, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, talk to them, tell them what you're seeing. Uh, we'd like it to be a conversation. And if you have any comments or suggestions for us, uh, please, please let us know. Um, in previous years, we've had these volunteer bags. I think there may be still a few available if people want them, but when, since we're not sampling, um, you know, they may not be really necessary, but they do help identify as a pure waters person, as does a, a sticker. So if I think there's some stickers still around uh, if you want one for your kayak, uh, again, to help as you're paddling by docks that people can see that, that you're on an official mission, uh, that can be good. And then a reminder to be our advocate, um, try to get people to understand what HABs are, train them, but also to become members here of uh, Pure Waters. So, uh, in summary, and then we'll go to the, the page and ask, answer questions. Um, please do report every time you do a survey. Um, you don't need anything but a phone or a life vest if you're in a kayak. Um, so one issue is just photos. So take care when you're doing your photos, really get that, that nice close-up view so that we can do a photo confirmation. Um, try to get familiar with the reporting system uh, and know you know, know your zone and coordinator. There's um, the 
uh, how to um, page in the uh, on the volunteer um, web page has uh, uh, some common errors. Let's go do that now. Okay, so um, here's the page. So. guide how to use the app so oh, I already had it open so here it has um, how to do it what the first parts are just like we went through a little bit more detail all right and then errors and this this is what um, kind of hurts me and it, and it hurts you but uh, the most typical errors are uh, wrong email address and wrong zone numbers. So please check those uh, before you send things out. I know sometimes we can be in a rush and do that. And a very um, good way to know that you put in the wrong email address is that you don't get an email response acknowledging that you input the report. So um, it helps if you, if you get, it, get it in there right. And then the zone number, obviously, that just that just causes some issues with uh, tracking and knowing when things are done. Okay, um, so it looks like there are some questions in the chat. I don't know, Caitlin, do you have you been tracking that? Yeah, there aren't too many right now, but we do encourage people to use the chat box for questions. One question was related to something that you did end up covering, and that was. Um, are there flags or stickers that um, would help the public identify monitors as volunteers? And you did mention the stickers um, and the bags. We do have we do have both of those in our office. Um, okay. I think we've got we we don't have hundreds of bags, but between the stickers and the bags, we could probably cover um, all the need that there is. Um, and I'd be happy to coordinate with the regional coordinators to get those out to people who needed them. Okay, great. Um, another question was about the app, which you also covered. Yes, we are using Arc G, uh, Survey123. Um, and I think the, the website that Bill has um, uploaded all of this information, the resource page for the monitors is gonna be really helpful for anybody who needs to review further. Um, but if you have questions, obviously reach out to your RCs or, or Bill or myself. Uh, How about if I, um, looks like we have some time. I'm just gonna go to the survey. So here we have the open in browser, open in the field app. So since I'm on the computer, I'm gonna open it in the browser. And then uh, it comes up with the various fields. So email address, First name, last name, we're on Seneca Lake. The zone is a drop down. So if you're on a phone, you know, it's gonna look different than it does here. Uh, date and time defaults to the current date and time. Uh, so if you're anywhere close, I wouldn't even worry about changing the time at all. Um, percent survey, drop down, um, bloom extent, small, large, big or no bloom. If it's no bloom, then you don't get all the bloom information. So you can see here that uh, the map will default to the Bight of Africa, which is zero degrees longitude and latitude. But when I put in my zone, minus 30, 66, then it shows the default location. So if I put in that there's a bloom, then I will get additional questions. So like we talked about the appearance and structure, the bloom intensity, bloom color, and the photos. And then if the, um, let's see if I got any photos here. So if I put in a photo, this didn't work. So it should have the latitude and longitude in here. Uh, that didn't happen. So it's using the, the zone as the default. And I can take that off. There's another one. So 
I just thought those worked. Works on my phone. There it is. All right. So there's the, the latitude and longitude. That that way you know that it's taking. And since it was taken in basically the same place, um, the the point didn't change that much. Okay. So that was a good reminder for, remind me for me. Couple more questions that yeah, um, posters, how can we get those? John Kessler's asking. Um, and John, we have a lot of posters. We'd love to distribute them. Um, I can get in touch with you personally to find out how many you need. And one thing that we would like to do is um, report where these posters are, um, where they end up. So, um, you know, location is important to us. Um, and you know, to have them widely distributed around the lake. The posters can be outside of Yates and Ontario, um, but they're, the posters are really durable. They're fade resistant. Um, they're going to last a, a nice long time and they really look great um, and they're eye-catching. So it'll be great to get those out there. So I'll reach yeah. out directly, John. Okay. Yeah, and if others are, are interested in that, uh, you can contact me directly or, or if you have Caitlin's address, contact her. Uh, or you can do it through the regional coordinators. They can pass it up the line too. That would be great. Uh, another question from Martin, um, trying to sign in via cell phone. What is the ArcGIS login or where can I find it? So that, um, again, just to, to go back through that is that you don't want to do a login. So when you get to this screen that I'm showing here, it says sign in, but don't sign in. It says continue without signing in. And because the form is public. So no need, no need to sign in. It's coming up, don't we don't have that. So you're not seeing this screen? No, not the screen on the right. No, on the left. Yeah, on the left. We, we hit we can when when we try to go continue as a guest or whatever, it comes up to, to download the survey. It asks for password and, and uh, username. We can't get the survey. Um, so did you go? Did you go to the to the link where it asks you to download into the app versus the um, um, browser? I just downloaded the app on my phone. So, yeah. So you have to go. You have to go now to the volunteer web page. Um, see if this has it. You have to go to the web page and click the link, and select. You know, you want to open it in the app. So the first time you use it, you have to go do that. Okay. So you so have to go to this. I did it about three times yesterday. Uh, and still yeah. Been through. All right, well, we'll, okay. we'll work on but that. I, I'm gonna put down two. There are settings and, and when I um, updated the uh, form, it's possible that it changed the settings back to requiring um, you know, a password or something in ArcGIS. So I will check that in ArcGIS. Make sure that that's public. And if you go you know, if you go to the website on your phone um, and then click the survey and then on the phone, you'll want to click this, the right hand box open in the field app. Okay. All right. We'd be happy to follow up, Martin, um, to make sure you guys get s situated with the app. Um, I'm sure RCs can be helpful, and you know we'll definitely get you get you where you need to be before we start monitoring. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll take care of that later. I won't take up any more time. Okay. Um, Bill, I have a question, um, and that is about um, you know when once you get inside the app, a lot of the um, inputs are, you know, they're sort of loaded in. They're multiple choice in a sense, um, besides, you know, name, email, and whatnot, water body. Mm -hmm. But then you come down and there's comments and it suggests, you know, special weather, water conditions, um, 
or describing the bloom. Are weather conditions helpful when you are collecting the data and um, learning more about when there is a bloom or isn't and what type of weather conditions were associated with that encounter? Um, yes, yeah, somewhat. I, I don't know that we go through all the comments per se, but certainly on blooms, if there's something you think is germane, uh, we'd like to hear about it. Since we started the DOC program, um, we actually have pretty good weather data up and down the lake. Um, so um, that's probably less important now than it has been in the past. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, people should, if, if there's something that you think is odd, particularly, you know, you're seeing a bloom and it's really wavy or something, that would be definitely something that we'd wanna, wanna see in the comments. Okay. Um, another question, is the presentation going to be available on the website? Yes, it is on the website. So the slides are there. Um, you can show you here. Uh, so here's the Pure Waters HAB training briefing. This is this is a set of slides at this link. Okay. And we have recorded this session um, and it should be available if you find it valuable to hear the discussions um, and the questions um, discussed. So we have recorded it and we'll make that available as well. It may not be on the website. Um, it may be, it may be uploaded to the website, but we'll be sure to get the recording out to everyone as well. Um, Barb Miller has asked, is the practice survey to be done on the computer or do we just go to the app now? If on the app, will you know it is a test? Yeah, so it'll be named differently. Um, let's see where we are. So the practice survey, actually I haven't tested it out this year, but it'll ask you the same question. So if you're on a computer, you wanna open it in a browser. And if you have your phone app loaded, you open it in a field app. So go to this link on your phone and then it'll download as a different form than what the other one is. So you'll have two forms uh, in your app um, instead of just the one. So if you do that, you make sure you open the right one later on when you're doing the real, real surveys. Make sure that's working. Yeah. So, all right. That's in the chat box as of right okay. now. Does anybody, if you want to unmute, if you want to ask questions or anything or comments? Uh, Bill, Bob Schieser here. Uh, I'm having trouble. I've got the app loaded on my phone. Okay. And you said something about I have to go on the website first to get to that app or I'm, I'm not. Yeah. Clear. So you're going to. So in order to download the form into the app, you you go to this page uh, on your phone browser. Okay. So whatever uh, you use there. All right, I don't have that on my phone, so I'll have to load that page then. Yep, you go to this page, and All then right. you hit this link here. So the first, this is just the first time, you know, this will yeah. download the form to your app. Okay. And then you'll then you'll access the form on your phone just by opening the app and without logging in, continuing. Okay. So all right. So I have to put the. Uh, Okay. All yeah, right. You have to get to this page. So just go. Um, I think there's been a couple of emails with the, the link in it. So just okay. go ahead. And, and if you can find those emails, hit the link on your phone and, and that should get you there. Okay. All right. Once it's set up, it works great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, 
Well, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, joining the training today. Uh, I hope it was useful. And um, we'll be in contact as we get ready to start the season and, and get everybody out there. I know it's always kind of tense until we start seeing the blooms. You know, when are we going to see it? Um, but it's a nice activity and it gets us outside and, and um, uh, you know, it's a good service to the community. So uh, we'll close for today and um, we'll be talking to you. Great. Thanks, Bill.